you also have, let's say, in terms of the spectral, people like Mar- Marina Abramovic, who is also one of the oh, featured boy. artists uh, in uh, your uh, di- in your digital uh, virtual gallery project. And you've noticed recently there was that Microsoft video that she did, which, hearkening back to what we talked about, virtual reality, incorporated her uh, Two Hearts exhibition in the frame of VR, but also there was such a big pushback to her. Microsoft took down the video. So what I'd like to discuss here, and I'm curious about uh, Geo's and Saturnalia's point of view specifically, because you guys really deep dip in, deep into all this stuff, not like surface level uh, normy ways of seeing it. Because <laughs> I don't want to look at this stuff either as just like, oh, this is like bad or evil or stuff like that. I want to dig down deep and see what exactly is going on here. It's, it's always very interesting to me that people. Uh you can draw this through line between um, psychedelia and mysticism and like virtual reality slash cybernetics. Um, I mean, I think these things have always been like pretty closely associated historically and for good reason. I mean, in, uh, in the 1990s, or I, I believe Timothy Leary said that uh, VR was the LSD of the 90s. Mm. And whether that was true then, I don't know, but I think it's, it's certainly true now. I, th- I think that he might have been a little bit too far ahead of that, his time in that. Was that the video that he did with Genesis Pure Ridge, was that the one? Um, ooh, I don't know. I just saw the quote written yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. How, how to operate uh, your have, brain? How to operate your brain? That was. I have a lot of thoughts on Genesis Pure Ridge too. Yeah, but... well, there, yeah. I I think uh, that no, it's very interesting because, uh, like me and Saturn Alias, and to a lesser extent, uh, Christina. Like I don't know. I don't want to throw her under the bus because you know professional job. But <laughs> no, but we have like we have like we interact with a lot of people who are on the more traditionalist or esoteric or like what would you call it like esoteric lines of thinking that are more predominantly on the political right and i think that i'm like within like the minority of that that actually appreciates things like brutalism and, and uh marina abramovic's work i think that she is indicative of a trend of sort of reintroducing mysticism and the occult and metaphysics within the contemporary world but I think that a lot of the interpretation of that becomes like, you know, the Alex Jones, like, you know, uh, she's a demonic priestess, you know, of the New World Order. Um, and I think that's, and that's a valid criticism because I think like when you rub shoulders with a lot of these elite people who have very nefarious goals and have various nefarious char- characters and, and ideas, I think that you should have, you have to, to some degree, divorce that from what she's actually trying to do. I think that there is a this ties into what we're talking about with with entheogens and things like that and in cybernetics i think that the fact that she's willing to become one of the first artists to, to use vr that's a further extension of her uh investigations into the world of the occult and the mystical and i think that's valid i mean of course i'm going to terribly offend a lot of my you know followers but i think that you know you could go a lot of different ways with that Oh, I, I mean, I think so. I mean, I, um, it, it's very interesting to me that uh, Abramovich had to come out and uh, defend, uh, she had put this statement out saying, like, defending herself, that she is, she is not a Satanist, she is not a, um, like, an evil wizard, which, I mean, is true. I mean, I mean that she's absolutely correct in that if you, like, re- really do, like, a, a deep dive into, like, the symbolism and the stuff she's referencing, it's not satanic. It's, she's not a, a, a Satanist. That's just not true. There's a lot of stuff in there about, like, like Greco-Roman mystery cults and like um, Demeter and, and yeah. uh, stuff like that. So I mean, totally that stuff. I don't know. I mean, well, the, a lot uh, of people do think that's satanic. But. The goddess you were mentioning in your uh, very uh, interesting uh, and very uh, in-depth Twitter posts about uh, about Abramovic, you were talking about Babylon, which was the goddess. Yeah that Alistair Crowley uh, wanted to summon. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit about that in relation to uh, uh, Marina Abramovic. So, I mean, I, I'm pretty, I, I've never seen Abramovic like mention the concept of like the Gnostic Babylon or Crowley's Babylon. But if, if you, you just, um, if you know what that is, like you, you can watch any of her works, even stuff like, um, like uh, Rhythm Zero, or, uh, mm. which is like also known as uh, The Artist is Present. Her, her statements are like transparently referential to that um w- within the system of thelema babylon is this this like transcendental mother whore virgin like ur feminine figure um pe- people 
like to say that it's woman liberated, but it's a lot more than that. It's um, it's the Dionysian aspect of it, right? Yeah, uh, kind of. But it, it's it's more than that. It, Babylon is like uh, like the all. She she's um, you, you can liken her to the concept of Nui and Hadi. Mm. Or what about uh, the concept of Kali? Uh, in um, Hinduism. Uh, yes. uh, um, oh God, in, in I forget which book of it was Crowley's. Um, Kali is an aspect of Babylon. Babylon is more analogous to uh, Shakti. Right? Mm. And Kali is like a, an avatar of Shakti. Well, Shakti is that primal energy that animates the universe, one that you would experience in states of uh, being on the psychedelic or in states of doing uh, Kundalini yoga. So we were talking a little bit about this uh, with, uh, with Patrick before, about cool. these altered states. So I'm curious, Patrick, how much have you looked into uh, these very interesting connections uh, with Marina Abramovic, as well as your own personal journey down the rabbit hole? I think it's interesting to think of like, like expanding the the, con the context of the art world. If you go back that fifty years to when she, you know, was starting that work on performance art, um, it was all about. It, it, we know it because of video, right? Which was the last disruptive technology that came in mm -hmm. and democratized cinema, which is also a very elitist situation because, or at least is now, where it's really hard to make a movie. Um, unless you're particularly in a network and there's a limited number of people in that crew because it's just like you know, there's just so many like hollywood stars and we have like a maybe an attention span about who we're going to listen to or are th or those that have become models but we just saw that kind of breakdown too right like people lost a lot of affection for for people because of the kind of again those disparities that kind of rupture between um realities and um so I, I keep looking for the upside here because I think that, you know, we have this 5D media, we have this stage. Wait, our, what do you mean by 5D media? Because you've used that uh, more than once. Oh, yeah, right. So that, that's really the error shift that we have interactive online distributed communications platforms that are more or less usually free, right? So, um, and, and, on the, and in these virtual spaces, this is... We dialed back our avatar thing because it really wasn't ready, but but that technology already exists, and um, and we'll we'll be we'll be doing that, and that'll that'll be interesting for certain people who don't want to get on a plane, who don't get on planes for environmental reasons, or you know, or, or can't get on a plane uh, for various reasons. So um, it's going to connect more people and um, still provide interesting experiences. People spend more time looking at an interactive thing because they get to express themselves as they look at it. So instead of just like flipping through an Instagram thing, which is great for certain things, obviously, and, and it brought a lot of new things to the forefront. Um, people will be spending like a few minutes in a room looking at things just the way they would in a, in a gallery in, about, in a similar way. Maybe minus the, the social aspect, but maybe the social aspect got so strong that like it was just a bit of a party and people forgot to look and didn't have time to read the liner notes or the wall text that they would really like to. So when we scanned some, you know, shows that we really loved, like I was really happy to be able to go back to a show and read the, and read the wall text and, and understand what the curator's intent was and and revisit a work that I may have like neglected to see or somebody told me about. So those conversations that exist in our memory and in our social discourse, on, you know, with text messages on the phone, whatever, or in person, now have another shared reference point, or you know, just like. Um, and think about like some mentioned Jerry Saltz earlier that you know he he's out there battling the trolls all day. It's like a fist fight in a bar in the 1970s. Like, Wait, who's <laughs> battling the trolls all day? Uh, yeah, he's, you know, he's he's putting himself out there, you know, like tripping over his feet, making missteps, apologizing, um, yeah. sharing <laughs> love, trying to help people out, promote his book. Um, you know, he's got a lot going on, and but but he, but he's become his own. He's made his own platform out of something that. You know, you would have been beholden to a magazine before, right? Mm. So for better or for worse, he gets to say whatever he wants, and then people let him know how they feel about it. But that's interaction. That's discourse. That's good. That's healthy, right? It's it's wow. great to have personal liberation. But like we were talking before about different communities of like-minded people starting up who want to influence the world with uh, money and the way that they see it, I do think that part of it would be for the sake of personal liberation of everyone. But a big philosophical question about freedom is, do you just want to be free from an oppressive government or do you also want to be free from your own inclinations which were 
put into you through your culture, through uh, society. That's another that, kind of, you know what I mean, right, Gio? That's like, the thing. What's the purpose of freedom? I think that's what we have to ask as artists. Um, you know, a, one of the greatest books I think that has ever been written on contemporary art is by uh, John David Ebert called Art After Metaphysics, where he clearly states out the thesis that with the great collapse of these meta narratives, we have to really examine what is the reality that, you know, Slaughterdyke called foam, uh, which is everyone's within a micro bubble interacting within their own framework. And the artist has become an icon onto himself or herself or herself, whatever. I think that we have to contend with the fact that we, when artists are free to do what they are doing on their own, in some ways, that's like, you know, the classic, uh, Eric Fromm, you're contempt, you're condemned to your own freedom. We have to really question the purpose of this artistic freedom, because does it produce something that is really cutting to people, or does it produce, uh, you know, banality sort of mm. after the orgy, like everything is not shocking anymore.